This is easily the most Pirates of the Caribbean-esque naval battle of World War II. Today we're talking about the USS Bory, a Clemson-class destroyer and its extremely young captain, Charles Hutchins, and in particular that time that they decided it was a good idea to ram into a German U-boat at 2 a.m. in pitch black in the Atlantic Ocean during a storm and proceeded to get into what amounts to a naval cage fight. But first, a word from our sponsor. This video is brought to you by World of Warships, the first and probably only video game that I'm ever gonna be a character in. Action stations! General Quarters. Yeah, for Veterans Day, you can unlock a new ship, the DD-214, and you can get me and my friend Matt over from Demolition Ranch, both as commanders for your ships. If you don't know, World of Warships is a free game on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox, where you get to command some of the greatest naval vessels of all time, like the USS Texas, the USS Iowa, or the USS Enterprise. Or if you're into losing, you can be some of the world's biggest coral reefs, like the Yamato or the Bismarck. Seriously though, go check it out. I'm gonna have it linked down below. And when you use the code vets for vets you're automatically gonna unlock me and Demo Matt, as well as a tier four battleship and a bunch of in-game money and 14 days of free premium play. So yeah, let me know how bad me and Matt are at voice acting in the comments down below. Let's get back to the video. All right, our story begins with Charles Hutchins. He graduated the U.S. Naval Academy in 1936. From there, he served on the battleship USS Nevada for approximately two years before transferring to a destroyer. He served there for a short time, and then he ended up resigning his commission, going back home, getting a wife, having a family, starting a career, and he was just out of the military. Fast forward a couple of years after that, Japanese attack Pearl Harbor, World War II kicks off, and he ends up rejoining the United States Navy in 1941. Now, to be completely intellectually honest, I was unable to find the actual context of why he decided to join. I'm not sure if he was motivated by Pearl Harbor and rejoined because of that. I'm not sure if he was concerned that he was going to get drafted, so he might as well rejoin on his own terms. I'm not sure whether or not he got voluntold that he had to go back into the United States military. However, for the purposes of storytelling, I'm going to go ahead and assume that it was a veteran getting called back into duty because somebody needed an ass whooping. Breathe in, you idiot! Mother's love. Regardless, 1941, he gets recommissioned and put in command of the USS Bory, which is a Clemson-class destroyer that's been in service since 1920. So obviously not a super new ship. In addition to that, the Clemson class destroyers had a well-known flaw where they did not have a very tight turn radius. And while that's probably not good for any ship, it's definitely not good for your destroyers because they're supposed to be the smaller, more nimble ships that were gonna be used to launch torpedoes, launch depth charges, and fight off submarines. Because of this, a lot of the Clemson class destroyers, including the USS Bory, never actually made it into the Pacific theater. Instead, they were sent over to the Atlantic, primarily being used to defend supply convoys from German U-boats. So for the first couple of years, that's primarily what the USS Bory is doing. They spend some time down in the Caribbean. They go down towards Brazil. They're over by Morocco, just defending supply convoys, moving items from here to there. Then in 1943, they go on a convoy down to Casablanca. And once they get there, they're informed, change of plans. You're no longer just running defense for these supply convoys anymore. Now, the reason for this is there's been a new invention called the High Frequency Direction Finder or the Huff Duff. And this thing does exactly what the name says it does. It intercepts radio signals and then tells you what direction they're coming from. Now, that doesn't seem like a big deal, but it's actually a humongous deal because in 1943, at this point in the war, the Germans are still under the impression that the Allied forces have not cracked the Enigma code, which means that they're just blasting high frequency radio waves all the time because they don't care if those radio waves get intercepted because until now, you could never tell which direction they were coming from. And if you didn't have the ability to decrypt their message, which they thought we didn't, there was no point to not just blast radio waves whenever you wanted. So now, rather than having a bunch of ships go out and escort supply convoys playing defense, they're gonna send out what's known as a hunter-killer group to hunt down the enemy submarines and destroy them. Okay, we're going from self-defense to self-offense. It's going to be way better. So the way this works is you're going to assemble a hunter-killer group called a task force. That's typically going to be an escort carrier, which is just a smaller aircraft carrier, and then two, three, four destroyers. They go out, they track down an enemy submarine. Destroyers drop the depth charges. That brings the submarine to the surface. Escort carrier sends up the planes. They destroy the sub. So because of this, the USS Bory is going to go and get refitted with some more equipment. Now it already has four four-inch guns, torpedoes, depth charges, and some 30 caliber machine guns guns, but in addition to that, it's going to get some better depth charge equipment, and then it's going to get two 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. You know, in case the Germans decide they want to surface their submarine and try to man their deck gun. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that should that situation arise, that submarine hatch has now functionally been turned into one big game of whack a German, and the mallet is two 20 millimeter fucking machine guns. I love this game. 
So they get all that, then they get the Huff Duff installed, and then they get attached to Hunter Killer Group 2114, which is being led by the escort carrier, the USS Card. So they go out and they start hunting down German submarines. You have to realize this is one of the first Hunter Killer Groups that the Americans have ever used, meaning the Germans don't really know what hit them. And because of that, they absolutely wreck house. On their first couple of missions, they for sure sink four submarines. They have three more probables and then a ton of damaged submarines as well. Because of this, the task force ends up getting awarded the presidential unit citation, which if you don't know, is the equivalent to the Medal of Honor, except for a military unit. Now, out of those four that were sunk, one of them was sunk by the USS Bory utilizing torpedoes. And what happened was the Germans got out of the U-boat, they got into their life rafts and they surrendered and they started firing these star clusters up in the air. And the Americans just kind of figured like, oh, this, they're still surrendering. They want us to see them, know where they're at. So they go out and they're attempting to rescue these Germans. And what had actually happened was they were utilizing these star clusters to signal where they were to another submarine. And that German submarine ended up firing a bunch of torpedoes at the USS Bory. Luckily, they missed and they still were able to recover all of the German sailors. After rescuing those Germans, they have to take them back to a port and to get there, they have to sail through a hurricane, which they said was absolutely horrifying, drop off the Germans, then they go out again on their fourth war patrol and that's where shit really gets out of hand. So they go out on their fourth war patrol, they're looking for enemy subs. The first time they make contact with one is actually on October 31st, 1943, AKA Halloween. Everything goes according to plan. The destroyers drop the depth charges, the enemy submarine surfaces, except there's actually two of them this time. And one of them is quite a bit bigger than the other one. This is a milk cow submarine, which is just a larger German U-boat that has a bunch of other supplies, ammunition, food, and fuel, and all the other smaller submarines stop and get resupplied by this large submarine. So if they can take out this big submarine, it's a huge deal because not only does it hamper that submarine individually, but it messes up the entire area of operation for the German U-boats. So the USS Card sends the planes up in the air. They start attacking the submarines. They end up sinking the smaller sub, which was U-boat 584, but the larger U-boat, U-boat 91, actually ends up submerging and trying to make a getaway. Now, the problem is that U-Boat 91 is fleeing away from all of the shipping lanes, which is kind of where the task force is still trying to remain in that area because that's where all the supply ships are. And the U-Boat knows that. And it knows that if it goes out into the open ocean where there's not going to be any ships that it can attack, the Americans are probably going to decide to stay and guard that shipping lane instead of chasing it into the open water, which is a brilliant strategy on the Germans' part because they're partially right. But also, America's petty. You fucked with our boats. Prepare to die. So the commander of the USS Card, Arnold J. Isbell, the man in charge of the entire task force, radios over to the USS Bory and basically says, go get them, we'll guard the shipping lanes. Immediately upon hearing this, Commander Hutchins of the USS Bory gets on the loudspeakers and informs his men, and I quote, gentlemen, we've been volunteered to go get that U-boat. And they all start cheering. Okay, the guys are motivated. They've got a presidential unit citation. They've been kicking the Germans ass the entire time ever since they went on the offensive. And now they're gonna go get these guys all by themselves. So the USS Bory breaks out of the formation goes off chasing this submarine on its own, but the submarine's got a big head start, so it takes them a while to track it back down using the Huff Duff. They think they found it. They drop the depth charges. Sure enough, a submarine surfaces. But this one's smaller. Definitely not U-Boat 91, but it's still, hey, it's a U-Boat, U-Boat 256. We're gonna go ahead and take it out. The submarine submerges again real quick, so they drop more depth charges, and then they hear a huge explosion underwater, and they just see a ton of oil all over the top of the ocean. They take that as the, we definitely just sunk that U-Boat, so they radio back to the task force, hey, we just took one out. We're going to go. We're going to find U-Boat 91 next. We're going to keep looking for it. Worth noting, U-Boat 256 wasn't actually sunk. It did manage to limp back to port. It was just critically damaged, but the guys think they've sunk a U-Boat, so they're pretty pumped. So they take off going in that same general direction, trying to pick up something on the Huff Duff that they can track down. After about an hour, they actually get a hit. It's way off in the distance, the max range on the Huff Duff. They head that way. They start chasing it down. The sun goes down. It's nighttime. They're staying up. Doesn't matter. They keep headed towards this signal, headed towards this signal. By the time they reach it, it's two in the morning and it is pitch black outside with 15 foot waves on a very rough ocean. And between being pitch black outside and the 15 foot waves, it's definitely not the time that you want to engage in naval warfare. However, if we don't touch their boat first, they're going to touch ours. So fuck them. Do not touch these. This is a no touching thing. So they get to where they think they're right on top of this sub and they go to dump some depth charges, but the equipment malfunctions and it dumps every depth charge they have loaded. The men on board said that the explosion was so large that it lifted the entire stern out of the water. Okay, just so we're on the same page, this is a 1300 ton warship, okay? That's like 2.4 million pounds and part of it just got lifted out of the water by this big ass fucking explosion. So obviously considering the destroyer damn near took flight, the submarine is damaged and they had to surface and they're like 
400 yards away from the Bori. Remember, it's 2 a.m. and there's 15 foot waves, so it takes them a minute to actually spot the sub with the spotlight. And by the time they see it, the Germans are already on top of the sub manning all the guns. So the Bori opens fire with the four inch guns and begins hitting the submarine. The submarine returns fire. And after a couple seconds of exchanging, all the Germans on top of the sub are dead and they've disabled the main gun. From here, the Bori starts closing in on it and the German commander realizes he doesn't have any other option but to try to do a U-turn because he knows that subs turn significantly sharper than American destroyers and turn around and be able to get behind the destroyer to hit it with torpedoes to be able to kill off the USS Bori. And Commander Hutchins realizes the exact same thing, which means there's only one thing to do. As the U-boat is turning at a sharper angle, the USS Bori is going to have to intercept it, ram it, and cut it in half. So Commander Hutchins gives the order over the loudspeakers. They pick up as much speed as possible to ram this submarine as they continue firing on it as they close in closer and closer on a collision course with this sub. The USS Bori ends up colliding with this submarine, U-boat 405, at a 30 degree angle, but because of the 15 foot waves, when they collided, the USS Bori was higher than the submarine was, and it didn't cut through it, it landed on top of it. So the USS Bori is essentially high centered on U-Boat 405, and U-Boat 405 is so critically damaged that it can't submerge anymore. So they are essentially stuck on top of one another in the pitch black of night at 2 a.m. with nothing but spotlights riding out 15 foot waves together. I beg your pardon, I didn't think Get off! which is horrible for the USS Bori because now none of the guns on the deck can aim low enough to actually hit the sub because it's literally underneath the boat. And while U-Boat 405's main gun has been disabled, which is good news for the Americans, it still has six anti-aircraft flak cannons on top, which are gonna do some damage at point blank range. So at this point, all the sailors on the USS Bori are like, fuck, we need guns. Some of them go to get guns. They got shotguns and Thompsons on board. In the meantime, the rest of the sailors just start throwing everything not bolted down at the Germans as they're trying to come out of this submarine to man the guns. And what happens next is gonna come directly from the declassified after action report. And I quote, one man was killed by a knife thrown from Bori's deck and which buried itself in the man's stomach. Another was knocked overboard by an empty four inch shell casing thrown by the gun captain of gun number two, which he could not bear. Okay, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. Shell casing kill, probably pretty rare. Getting a knife kill on a dude inside of a fucking submarine, probably the only time it's ever happened in human history. I saw that. Brick killed a guy. Did you throw a trident? Yeah. For a couple of minutes, it just turns into a complete shit show. The Germans are shooting at the Americans with flare guns while the Americans are throwing random shit at the Germans, trying to make sure they don't make it to the flat cannons. But then the other Americans finally show back up with the shotguns and the Tommy guns, at which point the Americans are just farming the Germans for XP. I mean, they've got one spawn point with one hole they have to crawl through. They've got no shot. Where's because of Regardless, the Germans still continue to try to make their way over to the flat cannons, but get mowed down almost every time. A couple of them actually do make it to the flat cannons and open fire, but they don't last very long. And while that's going on, you've got a bunch of dudes with crowbars trying to pry the ship off a of U-boat 405 so they can break free. And those guys aren't aware of it at the time, but below deck, the USS Bori is critically damaged and taking on water, and the damage control crew down below is in full swing, doing everything they can to keep the pumps running, to keep water out of the ship, and to keep the engines going so they can reverse away from U-Boat 405. And while all of this insanity is going on, Commander Hutchins still has the, the wherewithal and the knowledge and the understanding of the men that fight wars to get over the loudspeakers and yell, do not board the enemy vessel, which was a thousand percent gonna happen if he didn't tell him not to. After 10 long, crazy minutes of what amounts to a pirate fight, they finally managed to break free from U-Boat 405. And by this time, the damage control guys down below deck are literally up to their elbows in water and the pumps are not keeping up. So at this point, the USS Bori, critically damaged, taken on water, can only move at a reduced speed. Same thing with U-Boat 405, critically damaged, only able to move at a reduced speed and it's missing half or more of its crew. And at this point, you're thinking like, okay, maybe, maybe both of them should just call it a day. But no, the second U-Boat 405 breaks free, they immediately start maneuvering to get around and get that angle they need to fire torpedoes at the USS Bori. What a stupid son of a bitch. And Commander Hutchins isn't gonna be able to do shit about it. He's got worse maneuverability and he's moving slower than this U-boat. There's literally nothing he can do. So thinking fast, he orders everybody to kill all the lights on top of the ship. And submarines don't have spotlights. So now nobody can see anything. It is just black, right in 15 foot waves. 
So U-Boat 405 does the only thing it can do at this point, and it decides it's going to cut and run, at which point Commander Hutchins in the USS Bory has the same opportunity. Do I want to call this a day and limp this home, or do I want to try to finish it? We're electing to finish it, okay? This is like two heavyweight fighters in the fifth round, completely gassed, throwing punches at each other that don't actually hurt, but God damn it, we're in a fight. So obviously U-Boat 405 is sending out radio signals. They need help. They need backup. They need somebody to come save them, and they don't know that the USS Bory has the huff duff and can use that to see where where they are in the dead of night with no light. So the USS Bory under the cover of darkness maneuvers to where they're going to be able to engage the submarine and they light it up. They hit it with depth charges. They start firing on it with the four inch guns. Then they hit it with the spotlight. And after a couple minutes, a bunch of the crew comes out waving hands. They're ready to surrender. They're shining the spotlight on them as the 15 surviving crew members get inside some rafts. The rafts start drifting towards the ship as the submarine explodes and sinks to the ocean floor. This may or may not have been due to scuttling charges at the German men set right before they got out of the ship, but regardless, everybody on the USS Bory is cheering at this point because they haven't lost a single man. As these rafts start getting closer and closer to the USS Bory, the Germans start shooting up star clusters, at which point Commander Hutchins is like, oh shit, I've seen this before. And as soon as he thinks that to himself, one of his men screams, torpedo incoming, because they spotted it in the water. He orders the USS Bory to bank as hard and as tight as it possibly can to avoid this torpedo, which it luckily does. Unfortunately, this evasive maneuver forced them to actually drop right in between the two life rafts, splitting them apart, which may or may not have capsized the rafts and killed them. We have no idea, and the USS Bory wasn't sticking around to find out because there's a sub out there shooting torpedoes at them. The USS Bory takes off doing a zigzag pattern trying to evade this submarine. Hopefully that sub is going to stop chasing them and go rescue their guys. And below deck, things are not looking good for the USS Bory because at this point, Lieutenant Morrison R. Brown, the engineering officer, is standing in water up to his neck trying to keep the ship afloat after ordering all the other men above deck. And he continued to do this until there was literally no room left for him to breathe inside of the engine room, for which he would be awarded the Naval Cross. Other members of the damage control crew would also receive the Naval Cross and Silver Stars. At this point, the USS Bory is somehow still managing to barely limp along moving forward, but they've lost all auxiliary power, the pumps below aren't keeping up, and this ship is absolutely going down. Commander Hutchins, just trying to buy time, orders all of his men to start throwing over any extra weight they can find. By this point, it's daylight, which is honestly worse because that means that the enemy submarines are going to be able to see them. In addition to that, the generator for the emergency radio and the homing beacon isn't working, so they're not going to be able to radio for help. So the communications officer does the most MacGyver shit I've ever heard of in my life and manages to get the emergency radio generator running with the alcohol-based fuel from a torpedo, aka torpedo juice, and Zippo lighter fluid. Shortly after that time, they're able to send the radio message out to the task force. The USS card sends up planes to go find them. Once the planes actually spot them, okay, that's good. Now they just have to keep the boat floating long enough for the task force to make it to them. So that's what they do. They do everything to keep the ship afloat while they wait and they wait and they wait and hours go by and it's noon, it's one, it's two, it's three, it's four o'clock in the afternoon and the sun's starting to go down and finally Commander Hutchins has to make the call because if he has to abandon ship in the middle of the night, it's going to be a catastrophe because they don't have any power for lights anymore and nobody's going to be able to see shit. So he has to decide if he thinks this boat can stay up afloat all night long or he needs to get his men in the life rafts right now. So he makes a call. He orders all of his men to abandon ship and get in the life rafts and they are in those life rafts all night long and during the that time, 27 men die from hypothermia and injuries from the previous day's fight. The next morning, the task force does show up, the rest of the men get saved, and the USS Bory is still kind of barely half-assed floating above the waterline, and we can't leave that behind. So, the USS Card sends up some dive bombers, they sink the USS Bory. Despite the loss of the USS Bory and some members of its crew, it is still seen as a tremendous victory and the turning point of the Battle of the Atlantic. For that, Commander Hutchins was awarded the Navy Cross. So, in conclusion, that is the story of the USS Bory and her crew, the ship that helped usher in the end of German wolf pack dominance in the Atlantic Ocean and usher in a new era of American hunter killer groups. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch. Doesn't really work when I'm wearing a sling. Fluck will put it up on the camera. Thanks for watching. Quack bang out. I know a million of you have already asked in the comments section already by this point in the video. Uh, I tore my pec doing jujitsu and had to have it repaired. So they basically like drill a hole through my bone and then grab my pec tendon, pull it through my bone and put a pin through it. And then my bone has to reheal around my pec. So I'll be in this sling for like the next six weeks. It'll be a good time. Thanks for watching. See you guys later. You will have a chance in the next 10, 20 and 30 years to serve the cause of freedom and your country all over the globe.
to hold positions of the highest responsibility, to recognize that upon your good judgment in many cases may well rest not only the well-being of the men with whom you serve, but also in a very real sense the security of your country. I can imagine no more rewarding a career and any man who may be asked in this century what he did to make his life worthwhile, I think, can respond with a good deal of pride and satisfaction. I served in the United States Navy 